Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm just telling you that I've just rushed in and I'm a bit overexcited, so I'm going to try and calm down by singing the song. Wow. Can we take the We Are Live away? Because I'm going to have to read the name here, Anton. Thank you very much. A quick hello, and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Yagneshwar and Ganesh. That's amazing. You got my name right, and I love the song. This is amazing. Brilliant. Yeah, I was a bit nervous Expect about no that less one. from a singer and a musician. <laughs> well, there are, there are a vast number of syllables in that name, and they don't really go together in my brain so very well. <laughs> we'll see how I do at the end by the time we've had this conversation. Welcome, Yag. It, I, I'm just going to use Yag throughout the Absolutely. show because go for it. otherwise it will never end. It will just, yeah, yeah anyway. Um yeah, uh, delighted to have you. I was on your show, and that was absolutely lovely talking about knowledge panels. And now we're having you back to talk about branding in a more broad sense. Um, now, what I've been doing is spying on you and looking at the brand search, which is what I always do. So if we can have that first screen up, you actually get the the, the name Brand Serp Maestro, because wow. that is a good brand serp. It's got the knowledge panel, it's got four social media accounts, it's got the entity home, it's got your home, your website right at the top, it's got your Twitter boxes, which are obviously terribly, terribly exciting, and three video boxes, one of which comes from YouTube, but in fact, please be aware, everybody, another one comes from Twitter, and another one comes from a, a specific website, which shows that when you do your work properly, when you're good with your video and you're good with your audience, you get those videos from other places on YouTube, you dominate your brand surf, and you become, like Yag, brand surf maestro. <laughs> and if we go to the next one, there you go. We've been working with CaliCube, CaliCube Pro. You're one of the beta testers, and it's been great fun. And here we can see we've been working on the description. You worked on it. I had a quick work on it. Um, we had a quick discussion, and we've managed to get your podcast into the basically writing a description without any context, we managed to get Google to understand that it's a radio show podcast. That's basically as close as you'll get with Google's categorization in the business and industrial sector. And it recognized the podcast, a work of art, no less. <laughs> right. And all marketing professionals, sales, B2B marketers, sales professionals, B2B SaaS industry, that's a great context cloud, as Bill Slavsky would say. That is a really good description. And what I am pushing towards with CaliQ Pro is if we can get Google to understand which category you're in and uh, what are the entities around your brand and what are the relevant keywords, the relevant, sorry, the re relevant entities around that brand or that entity, then once you put it in context on the sites, on your own site, on other sites, on Apple Podcasts and so on, it's going to make so much sense. It's going to be so confident. And if we show that next one, we also found the Knowledge Graph ID, the unique, unique identifier for this podcast in Google's Knowledge Graph, in the, the podcast vertical of the Knowledge Graph, which is a great find. And we can start working on that and porting that into the main Knowledge Graph. And you even got a feature snippet, thanks to CaliCube, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. This is amazing. I it love is. this. I, I didn't see the snippet. This is the first time I'm looking at it. So thanks for the surprise. Well, as uh, Andrea Volpini from WordList says, the feature snippet is a big step towards that knowledge panel simply because yeah. it means that Google's algorithms, the, the summary algorithms, can summarize and understand that you're describing this podcast. It recognizes yeah. the podcast as a thing. You're well on the way to, to getting your, your knowledge panel, which is the next step with CaliCube Pro. Thank you, Yad, for being, I was going to say a goat, but that's not the right term, is it? <laughs> no, I, I'll be an enthusiast. That's good enough. A and, guinea pig. Uh... That was what I was looking for. <laughs> it starts with a G. I said goat, and I'm sorry about that. That's terribly insulting. <laughs> no, I mean, goat is also used for greatest of all time. <laughs> Wonderful. So right. That. After that terrible insult, shall we move on to the topic of the day, which is building Absolutely. brand narrative? I mean, I get yeah. terribly excited about entities and brands and Google understanding your brand and getting your knowledge panel. And you're looking at it in a much wider perspective is what story are you trying to tell? Yeah. So go Absolutely. ahead. You're, you're, you're the man for this. So I'll let you start. 
Yeah, so uh, so when it comes to brand narrative, uh, you know, the way I like to look at it is um, how somebody understands your brand. You know, uh, it could be like uh, there are a set of people who talk about it from a categorization standpoint. They would say that, hey, have a category design or, uh, you know, put yourself into a category like, say, uh, are you an e-commerce company? Are you a chatbot and things like that? But narrative is more of the story that, um, you know, the mind share and the story that customers carry in their heads about you so to give you an example you know let's take uh, two products that are in the same sector like say a product like intercom and then let's also look at a product like drift they both are live chat tools they both yeah. are chatbots but uh, the moment you think of intercom you're thinking about customer support and the moment you're thinking of drift you're thinking about marketing and sales you know that's right. that's the mindset and uh, so they are not, uh, Drift did not come out to the world and say that, hey, you know what, we are a revolutionary chatbot or we are a revolutionary live chat tool. No, I mean, they came into the industry after probably three or four years um, since Intercom was already there and they were already unicorn back then. But when Drift came in, they said, you know what, we don't even want people who want to use our chat tool for a support use case or a customer success use case. Uh, we are going to purely focus ourselves on marketers and salespeople and instead of calling themselves a live chat tool they started talking about conversational marketing then they started talking about conversational sales and now they are talking about revenue acceleration so that is the narrative you know that narrative tells you who they are for what they stand for and what problem are they solving and once that's done that becomes much easier right yeah so i was what what struck me is that a narrative has to have a focus doesn't it and if you don't have a focus you can't really have a narrative and somebody who tries to sell to everybody yeah, absolutely. Is by by uh, definition, I, never going to have a real narrative or doesn't have a narrative. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So it's, I wouldn't say it, you have to always uh, confine it to a specific kind of person, but the same person can be, you know, different things at different times. Uh, think of a brand like Apple, for example, you know, mm -hmm. they started with uh, a, uh, purely a Mac that is uh, computers. And from there they went to an iPhone and then they had this iPod. And uh, right now they are even um, uh, go venturing into headphones. So, these are completely different sets of products, but the fundamental narrative there is that anybody who has a taste for good design and, um, you know, if you want to be seen as a person who has a good design and derives status from that, then you start using Apple as a product. So that's the narrative. So that does not cater to a specific audience, but that caters to a particular emotion. So narrative can be blended in any way. Right. Okay. And What's Microsoft's narrative then? Uh, <laughs> that's very hard to say because it's confusing. And yep. I'm not a Microsoft fan per se in terms of, uh, you know, what they stand for. Because certain products, um, I would say they have made everything affordable and, uh, you know, far more usable by people. Yeah. So that's, that's something that they stand for. They have probably democratized uh, the PC to the world. Whereas, uh, you know, Apple was for a specific kind of people. And uh, PC was for everybody else. Right, okay. So Microsoft, cheap and cheerful. Uh, Apple. <laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, 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 it, it is that. I'm, I remember back in the 90s when I was kind of looking at computers for the first time in a, in a consumer sense. Uh, it yeah. really was, you know, Apple is for the geeks and the people who like design. And yeah. Microsoft is really um, making it available to everybody, democratizing yes. the, the access. Yeah. Um, and... I don't know whether Microsoft have, have retained that narrative. Uh, I mean, Bill Gates left and they suddenly became much nicer, I would suggest. Not because Bill Gates isn't a nice person necessarily, but <laughs> I find that, or, or maybe it's that we like them more because everybody else has become just as bad as Microsoft were before. <laughs> no, it's. It, I think it's more about uh, how Microsoft has taken its direction, you know, like say, for yeah. example, uh, I would still say um, there are certain products that um, I'm not very happy with Microsoft, but at the same time, um, I think they've done a decent job ever since they've taken over a product like LinkedIn. You know, I've been an avid LinkedIn user for like ever since 2008. And I think the evolution of LinkedIn shows that the acquisition of Microsoft was not bad. So that way I give full marks to them. Right, brilliant. Yeah, I see you on LinkedIn all the time. What was it like right at the beginning? Well, um, so it's been a huge transition in the sense um, in 2008 and nine, LinkedIn was more uh, towards group-based conversations. There were like different groups based on different topics. 
and uh, you had to uh, in each of those groups you had moderators and uh, to have a discussion in the group you have to make sure that you are following those rules it was mm. more like you know posting something on reddit and uh, then right now when you look at the transition it's more about conversations on posts because linkedin has become that platform which is uh, more about content creation and it helps and promotes everybody who creates more and more content and and even the evolution right right now um b2b happens more on linkedin i uh, you know most of the good connections that i've had over the last 10 years or so have been because of linkedin and uh, the best part about that is uh, i would say uh, even my current job at avoma right so uh, it happened because of linkedin i did not even apply for the job you know i started a conversation oh. I, i i've been a user of avoma i i love this product and then uh, i reached out to the, the ceo i said i i love your product and uh, i see that you don't have a marketing person are you looking for one and he said let's have a conversation and uh, 3 weeks later i had an offer so you know linkedin helps a lot brilliant wonderful now how about the the brand narrative within linkedin i mean i think you 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 specialize in b2b specifically yeah so yeah. linkedin is your focus now how can you bring a brand narrative to your audience through linkedin i mean is it just through posting madly lots of things every day <laughs> no it's not just about posting but it's also i would say it's an approach where um, you connect with the right kinds of people and uh, it's it's about building those relationships the fundamental to any uh, brand building or brand narrative or any storytelling is uh, you know i like this phrase that goes like uh, build long term relationships with long term people and um, there's also a wonderful uh, philosophy that i shared with you the other day uh, where i said that you know um, nature uses its longest threads to weave its tapestry so the way i look at it is that you know it's important first to build trust mm. and um, once you build trust uh, that's when you business happens as a consequence so i'll give you an example um i i was writing one of my books um called is your marketing in sync or sinking and this happened way back in 2014 that's a and... funny joke i like that <laughs> i didn't actually yeah. know your book was called that and i'm sitting there going that's a stra- <laughs> oh no it's a good title it's funny yeah it is it is so um one of the basic things that i do with any book is that i believe it's not just about my knowledge and my perspectives and i try to interview people from different parts of the world and glean into their experience mm. and then um, you know push that into the book and linkedin played a fundamental role in making those connections happen and it so happened that i connected with a guy called chris um who was based out of netherlands and oh, uh, yeah chris from the netherlands now him incredibly <laughs> well <laughs> no which, right. which chris no you're not going to name him yeah i can name him i mean oh, he's right. a very good friend so his name is christian victor he runs a music marketing agency called ignite i i there's a good chance that you might know him <laughs> oh right no, right no 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 i i've been in the music industry for 30 years right right so yeah he manages a lot of bands there and uh, back then when i connected with him he was the cmo of a marketing agency and i asked him for uh, you know 20 minute appointment to uh, take some of his views our mm-hmm. conversation suddenly went on for 2 hours and fast forward 6 months i was in his house in netherlands in a place called enskede and he took me to the chamber of commerce and few other places and then you know uh, in 10 days we became such good friends that till date every year a uh, bearing uh, covid every year i've made it a point to visit him and spend at least uh, 10 or 20 days with him and uh, as a consequence we also have worked a lot together on many other things he has been um, he has written last words for almost all of my books and uh, right. we have collaborated on several things so what i'm trying to get through the story is that when you invest in building a relationship with the right kind of people you don't start qualifying but then you know you you build the relationships in the ballpark you know since i'm catering to say marketers and sales people because i'm in the world of martech so majority of my connections are going to be marketers and sales people hmm. and uh, naturally you know when i put out content i'm going to talk about things related to uh, marketing where the day to day problems that we face or some of the key issues i'm not trying to push my product or sell through my content or anything that i put on linkedin but i'm just trying to be helpful and at the same time i'm i'm thinking aloud you know i i can also receive opinions from people mm. and the other way around is it's not just me posting and waiting for people to interact on my posts it is also important for me to you know uh, go and interact with others on their content as well so the you can look at it more like you know content based networking if you can call it that way uh, it's more about using content to connect with people um so two or three times you talk with somebody 
and over a period of time you know you keep seeing their content and uh, then you get to understand how this person is and uh, you know say one or two months fast forward if there is a business related conversation at least the basic trust is already there you know who this person is it's not a cold pitch right, right yeah otherwise what happens on linkedin is there is this other set um, which uh, which do what i call as pitch slapping is that you can <laughs> get a connection slapping. request <laughs> yeah you is get that a connection a thing? request yeah it is it is it is a thing sorry is it a thing you made up or a thing that exists no 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 it is it is a thing that already exists i didn't make this up i'm so, so old <laughs> pitch slapping what it means is that uh, you know you get a connection request from someone the moment you accept they are going to be like hey you know what my company does this 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 or do you have something can we have a call Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> that's spit slapping. Exactly. Right. Slapping okay. you with a pitch. I hate spit slapping. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the opposite of it. So um, yeah. Again, coming back to the narrative part, right? So because you spend time on all these areas and uh, build your perspective, a lot of positive things happen. Like if I can give you an example of something like a clubhouse. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of that, but then um, it so happened that one fine day I was on clubhouse and uh, I had I saw that Guy Kawasaki was uh, talking on a specific topic, and he was having some sort of an AMA, and random thing happened that uh, he he thought like he asked people to ask questions and he was randomly picking people and he picked me because my name was very different <laughs> obviously <laughs> you can say that again yeah <laughs> and then uh, you know we had a good conversation i asked him a couple of questions the same day i emailed him i asked him would he like to be on, on my podcast and he immediately sent me his uh, calendar link and said book me you know those kind of things also happen so the point is you're trying to give first or trying to build a relationship rather than asking him to sell you something sorry but there's a question then is is, yes. is some of this down to your name because <laughs> you can, your you name stands that. out i mean it really does stand out um it it's it's for anybody who didn't get it at the beginning it's yagna shwaran ganesh which <laughs> has about awesome. 15 syllables <laughs> and 25 letters um and when 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 i mean when i saw it for the first time i thought that's a name and a half <laughs> so immediately it's like the red shirt people think okay right it, it, it's stuck in my brain for for, for that reason um yeah do, yeah do you think it, it that's a, a, a good marketing ploy that you've invented or is it just luck <laughs> no i would say my uh, parents were a little thoughtful with uh, their naming <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know to be honest uh, my name is my grandfather's grandfather's name so it came to me as a tradition <laughs> so that's right. how it happened but, so but you it, know it, it's not actually common within your generation even uh it's i would say uh, in the whole of india probably you would rarely have anybody else with the same name probably one or two at max you know in a country of a billion people <laughs> yeah i was going to say we're a country of billion people that's quite an achievement yeah yeah so that's so unique and i, I sometimes joke around saying that uh, my name is a very seo friendly name <laughs> definitely Yeah, yeah no, so that it's, I mean your your brand serp and and if we come back to narratives the brand narrative that you can tell on your brand serp you are in fact the brand serp maestro now now I'm beginning to think not necessarily because you're that good but because you're unique <laughs> uh, yeah. but it it does mean because you've got such a unique name that you can really tell your story I mean I I would imagine you've got a great deal of control of what a, what appears Right so um what happens is over a period of time see it's again uh, you know uh, the narrative aspect is something that you test and try over a period of time so what i mean by testing is that um you know when i started writing my books my first book was um, actually a fiction book i did not start writing with marketing books oh, my right. my first fiction book was called taken already you know it was a, a romantic thriller and wow. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, what i realized is that um, when i'm going to when i um, when i released that book i was also surprised that there were about 800 or 900 people who actually downloaded that book on kindle and i was right. like wow really and then there was um, you know i was uh, back then working full time uh, in a proper it uh, you know in a proper it environment and i realized that hey you know what me being here um, in this marketing circle i'm not going to be able to establish a name for myself in the world of fiction and uh, because i i don't have that background or because i don't have enough time that i'll be able to invest there that's not going to work and uh, i'm also very thankful to my uh, publisher uh, who came to me and who said yeah you know what uh, stop writing you're... fiction write something about marketing man yeah, is exactly. that what they said, said. 
yeah exactly he exactly said in this exact tone and I, it was more like hey you know what uh, if you're writing marketing books i'll publish you for free and if you're uh, going to continue for fiction i'm going to charge you double so that's your choice brilliant oh i like <laughs> i like this person whoever they are yeah absolutely and then he also said that and he was he had a reason he said hey you know what you're speaking on my, you know stages related to marketing you're consulting people and uh, you know people in the marketing circuit why are you wasting your time in fiction and that made yeah. a lot of sense I and that's exactly the reason it. that's exactly the reason why i named that book is your marketing in sync or sinking <laughs> brilliant okay now i was just kind of had this 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 image of you giving a talk and then saying oh and by the way don't forget to buy my romantic thriller <laughs> exactly and then people exactly. go what that would that would be completely off topic no he's right i agree with him so uh yeah. yag if you were going to a music career i will publish you for free if you do songs about marketing <laughs> but if you want to do songs for children or punk rock i will charge you double <laughs> exactly you sound like my publisher so cool so and yeah chris. that's 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 one yeah and chris of course and uh, you know that's the realization that also came into my entire um, branding and narrative building over a period of time and one of the things is that narrative is not about hey this is what i want to say but it should also be something that you truly believe in you know if you cannot right. stand by that for long then it does not work right so if if i uh, if i try to behave like somebody i'm not and uh, my brand story will not stand the test of time you know like say my fundamental approach is being a little funny or being simple and straightforward and if i try to use very sophisticated words and if i try to uh, behave in a cocky manner that's not my style you know it might work for somebody else but it's not for me so you know that essence that story and then again um, that narrative also carry down into the kind of products that i was promoting or that I, i got into like i moved from it management into martech because i realized that i did not relate to the day to day lives of uh, say it management folks like say people who are system admins or network yeah. admins i had a terrible time you know i should be honest like there are a couple of jobs where i was literally uh, you know pushing my luck and i felt that hey i was just translating the products Uh, and features into solutions and those kind of statements because i did not really understand the lives of these people and then i thought this is this is not how i'm going to build my career and then i moved to martech because i understood the life of marketers and sales people i am one myself right so from there i could realize what goes wrong and now instead of selling you the product and saying that hey this product does a b and c i'm going to talk to you about the product only if it's going to be extremely relevant and i understand that you're going through a problem and then i say that hey you know what uh, can i um, can this uh, is this something that seems like a solution then take a look at this so that's a whole different story but that happens only when you and i have trust like for example when i spoke to you about avoma for the first time uh, i did not talk to you right off the bat right so we probably have had like several conversations before that and then i said you know what um, because you're uh, talking about this and because you want to look at calls and get uh, information from that and yeah. since you have a small team a tool like this might help so that that's a whole different game and so that happens because narrative is also about you carrying your authority into that product or service so you cannot back a product if you don't truly believe in it so you your story needs to stand the test of time you unless if if i'm doing anything outside of martech i'll not be able to relate with my people because this is my audience and this is where i cater to and then i have to pick a product that i can truly believe in i have to be a user of it like if you ask me to talk about canva i'll talk about it you know if you ask me to talk about something like a simple cast which i use for my podcast i'd love to talk about it similarly if i'm talking about zencaster i would love to do about it so all these are set of products that i truly believe in and i'm invested in and then when i take up evangelism of these kind of products then i'll be able to say that story and that narrative goes on so i would say fundamental of any narrative is belief yeah so the, the narrative of the company needs to be right and you need to as an employee fit with the narrative yeah, yeah. i'm that, i'm now thinking if you, if you then also need to look at the people you're faced with the potential clients and ask yourself where do they fit into the narrative and do yeah, they fit exactly. into the narrative exactly yeah so for example you know again uh, there was a point in my entire life when i look at uh, you know all the products that i've represented there was there was a time where um, i was given a product that i was promoting and then there is a set of stage which i am in right now where i am picking the thing that i want to work on 
and i'm representing a company or a product that i'm absolutely proud of and i i would love to put my name on it and represent that so i think that makes a whole lot of difference and then uh, you know even reaching out to people right i'm not going to reach out to everyone i'm not going to say that uh, you know it's it's not going to be a standard opera pitch saying that hey you get a oma you get a oma everybody gets a oma no that's not how it's going to be right so it needs to be for a specific kind of people who are in b2b who are uh, you know on meetings every day and uh, who are going through a specific kind of problem and mm. if there is a workflow as to uh, how they are collaborating across teams and uh, what happens for them before the meeting during the meeting after the meeting and once i understand all of that then i would see if it makes sense for me to talk about the product to them and until then you no know, it's it's still important for me to uh, give them the solution and uh, not just talk about the product so you understand what the problem is and by that what happens is you will not tell the entire product story you will talk about that one or two things that is extremely critical to this particular user because that matters to them so adapting that narrative based on the user's use case is also important right okay but but we can't necessarily understand the users 100% i mean i for example i take cali q pro One yeah. of the problems I'm having is saying this is how I would use it, and I've been trying yeah. to ram that down people's throats. Yeah, and yeah. I now realise that I'm the only person in the world who looks at this stuff every single day. <laughs> yeah. And I was saying, Reverend, well, oh look, you can you can look at this every day and get really really geeky about it, really interested. And so far, I've found nobody, and literally nobody, who wants to look at this every day. And it now <laughs> re- I now realise that I don't understand how people will be using it. and i need to start being empathetic so my narrative was wrong uh i wouldn't say your narrative was wrong i would say um you know um like say for example um, i've i've known calicub for a long time right i would say at least a good 3 months now so i've hmm. been I, i've seen the transition of calicub from what it was probably sometime in uh, uh, february and what yeah, i'm when, seeing when, right when now when you said i don't understand what i'm supposed to do That that yeah, was a, yeah. that was a very good yeah. comment, and we then changed it, and now you understand what you're supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm coming to. You know, I, the narrative is that CaliCube solves a very clear problem. You know, you I, if I had to say what CaliCube helps me with, to my my specific Ooh, case, I would say that hey, you know what, Yag, uh, if you don't have a knowledge panel, uh, CaliCube will help you uh, to fit in all the parameters that would possibly. um you know um push google to mm-hmm. develop a knowledge panel for you something like that so I, the problem statement is very clear i uh, i don't have a knowledge panel for abm conversations podcast but now um calicube is going to show me a set of things that uh, my page is lacking and if i can fulfill those parameters then i'm indicative or i'm trying to uh, you know encourage google to move towards that direction and understand me better so you're solving that problem So once you get that picture uh, the right. difference between what you had and what I have is that you have all the technicalities of how the product works mm. but I'm coming from the area of what my problem is and how I would like to leverage Calicube so the use case and the story and the angle is very different you know if you're talking a different language to me uh if you're talking about hey you know what this is the uh google id and this is the serp score i don't yeah. care any of that <laughs> oh no well, that that was my whole I, i was so pleased with it and i'm trying to share it with everybody and everyone every, you're not the first one going i actually don't care just tell me what i need to do so yeah i i'm i'm rubbish at it. i'm i'm geeking out and getting really over excited about this because i think it's really cool but no it's a fantastic never... product uh, and i think i really i mean for all the people who are listening to this i would really say that it's a fantastic product and it really helps you i've seen a drastic change over the last 2 3 months i've learned a lot it's it's just the story right so rule number 1 is Obviously, it's a great product, but rule number one is don't listen to Jason geeking out. Just ask him to tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah, ask your questions to him and get that answered. <laughs> and then you know, once or, or you know, that's that's the that's exactly what I would say. You know, like let me give you an example of uh, what I do at Avoma for coming right. up with marketing content, right? So, um, see, um, a product like Avoma can be used by marketers, salespeople, and customer success folks. Now, for me, as a marketing use case, what I do is like. in my ceo and my uh, sales folks they are on calls every day so the first thing that i do in the morning is when i go for a jog i pick up my phone and i have the avoma app i plug it into my ears and uh, when i go for a jog i'm hearing uh, the three or four calls every day you know i'm i'm hearing what the prospects are talking about 
I'm hearing what kind right. of questions are they uh, asking. So, but does it, does it summarize it for you so you don't have to listen yeah, yeah, to the yeah. entire conversation? Of yeah, of course, of course. So, um, you know, if there are 10 calls, uh, I cannot uh, cover 10 calls in no. a span of one hour. So I'm, I'm going to look at the and notes. It, and the, it's the, boring. <laughs> yes, you can say that. Yeah, but, right. Uh, but what happens is I look at the notes, a quick summary, and uh, then I understand, like, I uh, pick and choose which calls I want to listen, right? So because in oh. that notes, it's, it's straightforward. It's one page bullets. And it's going to tell me that, hey, you know what, uh, these were uh, the competitors that they were comparing you with. And these were the pain points that they were talking about. And this is the feature that they are more excited about and things like that. And then sometimes there are questions like, hey, you know what, do you have a co comparison collateral? Or do you have an overview document of this? Or, or do you, can you send me something um, that I can share with my internal team to get the kickoff? Things like that. So when I see things like that, mm. then it gives me a good perspective of what are the kinds of content that I need to prioritize. You know, which competitor do I uh, prioritize first? Like where, uh, things like that. And yeah, what but, kind uh, of things? But, but yeah, the, sorry, it's not only kind of for your, your, your basic kind of how do, how do I address my audience on a sales basis, but also what content are we looking for? Because one of the major problems I see or I hear of within the industry is people looking for subjects to create content for, but they don't yeah. know what people are asking because the the sales staff and the support staff won't or don't share that information. Yeah, exactly. Basically, so you, what... can, you can just spy on them. <laughs> yeah, it, I wouldn't say it's spying. It's more of collaboration because the best Thank part you. is uh, That's when a much I... better way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah for example, you know, um, when I hear a call with my uh, account executive and uh, they, uh, like say, the other day you shared one of my... Uh, blog posts about filler words, right? Mm. So um, one of the things that happened was one of the prospect was asking uh, my account executive as to um, what is the impact of filler words on a sales outcome, you know? Uh, and then when I, that gave me a good idea. I said, okay, I sh let me uh, come up with a detailed blog post on exactly that. And uh, that gave me also a perspective to go back and do some analysis because we had a million calls that we can go back and make some analysis on. And then we realized that these are the three results. Now, that is not a salesy pitch, but that's something that helps a customer's question. So when you look at the content perspective, the biggest mm. change is that um, if I start with, hey, you know what, Jason, Omar does A, B, and C, then you're not interested. But when you have a problem, when you have a question, and I say that, hey, this is the solution to do that and bring the product into that context, then at least, you know, I'm not only solving your problem, but I'm showing you how it's done. So that's that's a whole different game now. So that's that's one of the things. And with respect to content, what happens is a lot of marketers spend a lot of time with something that we call as uh, top of the funnel content, which means um, hmm. they're trying to create awareness by talking about a problem statement and trying to uh, make the world understand that this is a problem. But that's not enough, right? So when you're a small company or when you are a small setup, um, you're looking for how things are going to translate from there into revenue. And if a marketer is not contributing to growth and revenue, uh, you know, he or she is not a marketer at all. That's my humble opinion, though. I, I know it's, it, it sounds a little blunt, but yes. that's what it mm. is. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds like the cruel thing the teacher says to you at school. You're not actually <laughs> any good at football. You will never be a professional footballer. Give up now <laughs> and do accountancy. Right. So, I mean, it's not that bad, but, uh, you know, fundamentally what happens is, um, like say right now in Avoma, I'm a, I'm a one man marketing team. So what happens is I have to prioritize the things that yields results. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm going to do things that are purely vanity metrics and I'm going to show my CEO that, you know what, I have so many, uh, leads that signed up and I have uh, so much of traffic. Uh, I'm going to be shown the door very quickly. You know, I have to add value to this entire process. So I need to do things that matters. Uh, I need to make sure that Oma is a brand that's known to people. Uh, at the same time, I have to facilitate partnerships. I have to facilitate um, the whole brand narrative and story and build content. So all of these things need to work together. That priority is where I think uh, is fundamentally important. People need to understand where we are going. So if I have to sit down and explain for 10 minutes and then people get, oh, this is what you do, then you don't have a narrative. Right. Okay. Um, but so, ten minutes to to describe what you're doing. I mean, could you describe what you do in a minute? You want me to describe what I do? Yeah, I want to. I, th this is the challenge now. Describe to me what you do in a minute. Right. So I right or now less. I'm <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So right now I'm trying to make a Uma brand. 
that's all. Oh, there you go. That was less than a minute. Brilliant. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so from, from your perspective, coming back to the brand narrative, I mean, the last thing you say in the description that you wrote for this episode is, and then if the Google Knowledge Panel also supports your story, it's game on. I like yeah. that idea because you're saying, I mean, I think kind of people forget that you need to tell your brand narrative through your brand SERP, that when people, prospects, clients, uh, potential hires, whoever it is, who's searching your brand name, they're interested in your brand. They need to say the same, see the same brand narrative they've been seeing on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube, on all the other platforms, on Crunchbase that they've, they've seen you already. That's point number one. Most people don't even look at that. And then the knowledge panel, which is Google's vision of what fact is about the brand, needs to reflect it. And isn't that a lot of people think it's an impossible job? I'll I'll make it uh, you know even more easier in a in in I can make you understand this in just a couple of words. So if Calicube is um, fundamentally telling you the story of what you want, and uh, your corroboration is what narrative building is, right? So what you describe to Google as to what you do is not enough. From there, it has to be everybody else who also speak about you the same way. You know uh, what your description and corroboration Ooh. needs to match. So, uh, like, say, oh, for example... But, 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 sorry, I'll let you come back in there, but that also means that you're, you're pushing out the corroboration to all these different platforms, which is, which is what I'm preaching at uh, CaliCube Pro. Yeah. And people say, yeah, all right, fair enough, I can do that. You, you're that's actually basically... helping people build a brand narrative. Yeah. And, yeah, Anders Schultz was saying that the other day, but it's multiple things. There's one, you have to think about that narrative before you write the text, because yes. once you push it out there, it's a pain in the bum yes. to go around and do it all again yes secondly the people who are seeing you on all these platforms will see you multiple times and they will end up parroting that brand narrative which means that everybody else which is what you were just saying is that if everybody else is pushing or, or repeating the brand narrative that you've put out there you're going to win the game and if they're yeah. not which is the case for a lot of brands because they're not very consistent you're going to lose the game yeah so either you know, you build a story for yourself or you will anyway be put into a box by people. Like say, right. if, if I have to give you an example, I'll, I'll probably talk about a product like Terminus, you know. Uh, when Terminus what, came into... What's Terminus? Terminus is an account-based marketing uh, platform and uh, right. they do they do this programmatic ads. Okay, so just that's, right. that's the background. And <laughs> in 2013 or 14, when the company was just coming into existence, it was not even a time where uh, people knew about account-based marketing, that the uh, account-based marketing as a concept was not even mainstream back then. So what they did was that every analyst or everybody that they met, they were trying to box the product into programmatic ads category. You know, right. but uh, the company was building an ABM narrative. They were talking an ABM story and they were saying that, no, we are not a programmatic ads tool. Yes, we do that as well, but we do that as part of account-based marketing. So that's where we are headed. So that's that's narrative building. And over a period of time, you know, uh, when Gartner starts to talk about them, when Forrester starts to talk about them, when the media starts to talk about them as uh, as an ABM tool, then today you're not even thinking about programmatic ads. The moment you're thinking of Terminus, you're thinking ABM. So similarly, every product, like with respect to my podcast on, on CaliCube, you know, I was certainly talking about ABM, this, 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 this. But then when I understood that, hey, this is how Google understands, I have to simplify it further. And what I love oh. the way you explained it. You said that, you know what, the best way to talk to Google is talk to talk to it as if you're talking to a seven-year-old or a six-year-old, right? That really helped me. And when I saw your videos, I, I, you know, cut down things and made it much more simpler. Once that happens, now the way I'm corroborating that or at least influencing the corroboration is that, I'm going to my base platform of Simplecast where I have uh, that description. I'm taking it there and then pasting it there. So what happens is that description immediately changes on Apple Podcasts. It changes on, uh, you know, right. Spotify. Like it changes everywhere. So if my podcast is in about 50, 60 places, now all these places are within a day or two, this gets syndicated there. And right. all these 60 or 70 URLs are now talking about um, you know, ABM Conversations podcast in a language that I just presented to them. Now, to Google, that corroboration is like, hey, everybody is talking the same language yep. about ABM Conversations podcast. Maybe that's what it is. And then they start to believe that story and then the knowledge panel happens, the KG happens and things like that. Brilliant. And also, as you said, the people who are talking about the podcast on social media will tend to repeat what you've already said in your description, yeah. especially if the description is simple, understandable and reusable. Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, really quickly for everybody, uh, next week we've got Sarah Sennett coming along to talk about, um, I can't remember what she's going to be talking about, but uh, thank you, Anton, you were a bit slow there and I was panicking. <laughs> Digital strategies for unpredictable audiences, which is going to be really interesting because unpredictable audiences are probably everybody's nightmare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jag. That was a lovely, lovely, delightful conversation. I think you're a wonderful person. And I'm going to retry to sing your name. A quick <laughs> goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Yagna Sharwawan. That was wrong. <laughs> you killed it I'll do it time. again. Thank you. Oh, God. It, 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 right. Thank you, Yagna Sharwawan. Amazing. I, Thank you so better. much, Jason. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, I loved it. And uh, this is one of those shows where I really had fun. You know, it, it does not even um, feel like a serious conversation. And yet we covered a lot of serious stuff. This is amazing. Yeah, thank you. You taught me a lot, and I'm going to start paying attention to my brand narrative and rethink how I'm thinking about how other people think about what it is I'm trying to teach them. Thank amazing. you very much. Thank you again. <laughs>